The following is a presentation of the Four Center podcast feed. From the center of the galaxy, this is the Four Center podcast feed, and this particular episode is Cues of the Force, Quantum Entanglement of the Force. No, it's Cues of the Force, but the Quantum Entanglement makes a little bit of sense in that this is one of our time travel episodes that we're recording quite a ways ahead of when we're releasing it. So there might be some uh, humorous time travel moments. We'll see. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. I'm getting abstract. I think we did okay with the last Q&A that had some big so. stuff between our recording and release, the Mando stuff. I think we did yeah, okay. I hmm. think we did. I think we were getting all all too good at, at time travel. <laughs> or yeah. else people are just being really kind in the comments. Yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. <laughs> one of the two. But we are very happy to be here. We want to let you know, as always, that today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash four center. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. This week, we are continuing to recommend Battle Scars by Sam Meggs. It's staring at me. It wants to be read. I can hear the book calling. Uh, we will be reading it eventually. If you want to be up on the book and ready to discuss it, you can download your free audiobook today by going to audibletrial.com slash four center. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash four center for your free audio book. And as we point out every once in a while, um, we, we have so many generous uh, listeners and viewers on YouTube. We know that uh, Patreon isn't for everybody. We maybe know that YouTube isn't for everybody. Uh, this really helps us, and it is truly <laughs> free for everyone involved. So if you'd like to help out and other stuff isn't for you, hey, get a free audiobook. It really helps us. Ken, we do have another ask. Yeah, speaking of... Uh... Uh, helping us and asking and just being invested and being part of this wonderful com community. We're, we're asking you all to check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash four center. We put a lot of new stuff there. There's a merch level. There is the exclusive Indiana Jones and the perilous podcast. It's exclusive on Patreon up until dial of destiny. Then after that, we will release it to the public because we want everyone to hear. But if you want to be on the road with us to dial of destiny, check it out. The first episode is already out released back on March 20th. Uh, just an overall look at Indiana Jones, the characters, the movies and the franchise. All of it, all of it's there. We'll be going into the specific movies very soon. We have a new goal out there. We're very close to reaching it. If we reach two thousand dollars a month, that will help us green light a new series. It's a Jennifer Landa YouTube NPR Star Wars uh, docu series type of thing. Here's what we're gonna do. <laughs> quite the description. We're going to go back to some of the old episodes that Jennifer's already got in the can. Happy Beeps, Jedi Beats. These are episodes that she did uh, back in the early days of Force Center. And yeah, you could go listen to them. It takes weeks to scroll through a list. We got over fourteen hundred episodes now, but also. Jennifer's excited about not just repurposing them for YouTube, but adding more into it, recording new parts of it, putting images over them, turning them into, quite frankly, mini docs or news stories. Uh, she's got wonderful, silly topics, the Star Wars holiday special, sounds, weird creatures, all those kind of things, but also wonderfully deep ones and important ones. Ben Burton, his story, Katie Lucas and her story, especially around Asajj Ventress. Um, Jennifer's really excited to make this happen, but there's something we want to make happen with your support over at patreon.com slash four center. There you go. That's our ask. That is a great ask and well delivered, Ken. With that, we are going to get into our cues, our actual questions. Uh, we have two from Twitter and two from our patrons on Patreon. As always, we're going to go first to Twitter and to Victor. Victor says, from time to time, I decide to gaze into the abyss. The comments and tweets of the Star Wars fandom. Uh, apparently, Disney is killing George Lucas's Star Wars. Is it true? What's the <laughs> difference between George's Star Wars and the Star Wars of Disney? If there is a difference, smiley face, thanks. Uh, Victor is, of course, being a little uh, tongue-in-cheek about uh, some of the negativity. As always, I think uh, we are big proponents here on Force Center of absolutely discuss analyze critique uh, be honest if something doesn't work for you or something or you don't like something or hey and there are people my age who grew up with the original trilogy and they just love the original trilogy and nothing else really worked for them and that's always fine with me as long as they aren't you know rude or cruel or, or mean in the way that they share their perspective. So uh, I always want to take a moment to to say that hey, it's fine to dislike things. It's fine to say that Disney Star Wars is not for me. Uh, but I think what Victor's getting at is uh, when there's a lot of uh, certainty and 
anger behind it. What, what are your big picture thoughts on that, Ken? Uh, my big picture thoughts is Victor's right. It's just, it's just, it's just ruined. It's all ruined. It's all ruined. But no, I echo, <laughs> I echo what you're saying about perspectives. Um, some folks, uh, folks I know just, you know, they don't want to see anything more. Uh, they, quite frankly, they didn't want to see anything after 1983 and, and they got good reasons for it. And that's, their journey. I can debate with them. I can quibble with them. I think the spirit that they think is missing is there, but I, I totally get it. It was, it was George. It was many other people with him. Let's not forget, uh, including geniuses like Ben Burt making the sounds and all that stuff a reality, but it's George and it's of George and, and it might feel a little different. Uh, but I really think when you look at it and you, and you let it in like mm -hmm. Matt Canada and the force awakens trailer, <laughs> force psychology, you let it in. Uh, I think you'll find that the same feeling is there, just packaged a lot differently and maybe directed at other folks, not just you. Yeah, that is a great uh, a great teaser for the, the substantive mm -hmm. conversation. So it, we're in a safe space here. We love George Lucas's Star Wars and, and we love uh, all of the Star Wars that has been created since the sale of the company. So for you, what is the same? What is different? The, the biggest, the difference is, and I think there's something, and I'll start maybe on the more negative side of it. I, I, I think the, the some that George would even say, maybe as, as some of it slipped out in some interviews, I, I don't know. I don't have it in front of me, but that, hey, that it is very much looking at what was done before and, and, and kind of continuing that in terms of presentation style, even down to the characters. Um, and, and I understand that George as an artist to the core would always want to do something different. I think a lot of the elements would have shown up in his seven, eight and nine, but I think without a doubt, there would have been things that you might've been like, wow, that was not where I thought. I, I think that's one way to look at it. But I, I do think that the biggest difference is, is one of the things that you've touched upon a lot about seven, eight and nine, just the movies overall that, that these modern day Star Wars, no matter who's doing it, by the way, you know, if George had continued, he'd have to wrestle with this a little bit. I would think that, it, that Star Wars exists in a, in, in, a, in a pop culture landscape where Star Wars existed. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Star Wars can't escape old Star Wars. So I think new Star Wars really does what it can to engage with that, to, to make you look at it in a different way by also being aware of, of what we're talking about Star Wars for other people. Uh, I, I, I think on the surface, you could, you could, that could stop you. And then it might seem like it's a big difference. And I think even for the man, man in flannel at times, but that's just because, he would love to go to a sub microbial level and talk about the wills and midichlorians and, and uh, he might approach it differently. Um, but I th still think it would be the same vibe. You'd still have old man Luke. You'd still have a new hero. You'd still have all that. And it just would be wrestling with what came before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I really, really like that. And I think we'd have a, a, a obviously old man Luke has, has been discussed uh, quite a bit uh, mm -hmm. getting older and not everything turned out exactly as you planned. That was something that's clearly close to Lucas's heart because old man Luke was already a part of his plan. So some of those big sort of life lessons, I think, might be different, might be the same, whereas it would be really different if, if Lucas had was invested in telling a story where the characters that we knew was kind of flesh and blood people, Luke, Han, Leia, had kind of passed into legend. If great Vader, you know, made a better choice at the end of his life and made a huge difference and fulfilled the prophecy of the chosen one. But he was Vader for a long time in the shadow of those choices is still cast over everything. Mm -hmm. I, I think Abrams and Johnson and, and everybody involved in that storytelling, all of the writers um, from Lawrence Kasdan to, to Chris Terrio, we're able to to reflect a little bit on that legacy. And I think Lucas might have a different perspective because he'd be reflecting on his own legacy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Kasdan arguably is doing that as well as a script writer since he was such a, a, a huge part of the original trilogy. But that's really, that's really fun and interesting to think about. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whether he wants to or not, right? He'd have to wrestle with his own legacy. Maybe yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so for me, I think um, things that, that might be different um, is that, you know, Lu Lucas is a very unique individual artist. He's one of the most famous and successful creators uh, of his time. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot that's attached to him about popular, right? Uh, mm -hmm. he, he helped create the blockbuster movies. He helped amp up merchandising. He helped amp up uh, CGI, all these things that are kind of coded as being 
uh, successful. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, if you're going to be negative, uh, as some people are, coded with sellout, not real art. But within that, he is he is such an auteur, right? He is such a, I want to do it this way. I just saw a TikTok uh, from an interview. I don't know if it was 60 Minutes or what. Mm. Um an interview with Lucas, it was just a TikTok and I didn't have time to to track down what the actual interview is from. It's clearly the ramp up to Revenge of the Sith. Mm -hmm. Um, Because uh, the the interview is asking Lucas, are you worried about how the critics will receive this last one? (laughs) Ah. And George kind of laughs like, no, no. No. If if you really dig into it, they've they've never liked any of them. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he he says... uh, um, which is similar to things that that many of us in the Star Wars talking world and many fans talk about, and many creators talk about. He's like, so often people, like, maybe they have a good idea or whatever, but they're like, hey, um, you should have painted that house green. And Lucas is like, hey, it might look great green. I wanted to paint it white, and I made it, and I painted it white. And don't don't just tell me it should be green. Yeah. <laughs> you know, which yeah. I think goes into such the artist perspective of I I am making something and it is fine for people to react to it the way it is, but it's not a a you know a project uh, that is like you know it, it's set to the ideal parameters. It's mm-hmm. it's one person's artistic vision. So I think um, I think Lucas so comes from that perspective. There might be some things different, uh, you know, stranger, more idiosyncratic. Um, yeah. He's all of all of what he created did go through a funnel of massively talented people, right? Uh, the yeah. directors, the editors, John Williams, Ben Burt, uh, John Molo, the costume designer. Let's give mm-hmm. the, you know him a huge amount of credit. What well, Ralph McQuarrie? Like uh, you, yeah. we know a lot of these names that helped make Doug Chang, right? Who, who helped make him uh, helped him make Star Wars what it is. Um, yeah. The things that I think might be different is I think Lucas would have been more blatant about politics. Uh, about the political mm-hmm. situation in the films mm-hmm. and in the TV shows, we're getting there, I think to Lucas level of politics in episodes yeah. like the convert. Right. Yep. Um, I yep. think he would have dug deeper on midi chlorians metaphysical aspects of the force, partially because he, he said that. Um, but I also just think that there is a part of him that remains the rebel in flannel where he kind of bristles. And there's almost like if you, if he hears enough people saying, don't do that, he's, he's got a little bit of like, well, maybe I will. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, totally so. Truly that interview, I don't know where that one is from either, where, where somebody asked him his favorite episode of Clone Wars. And he, he, he kind of has a little sparkle in his eyes. I'm like, yeah, you know, uh, the D-Squad, you know, the multi-part <laughs> droid adventure with the weird frog guy that uh, a lot of you fans don't like. That's yeah. my favorite. Like, there's a little bit of him that's got that. You know, he he looks so establishment. You know, he remade the industry, sitting there in his flannel, a billionaire in his flannel, a billionaire establishment man in his flannel. But there's still that like, eh, you want you don't want me to do that? All right, well we'll see. It, mm-hmm. You know, so I think what would have emerged from that attitude, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we'll never know, right? We will and that's never know. Thing. We'll never know because he sold it. He sold and- it. Yeah, that's not a finger wag at George. It's like that's kind of a, I enter that into the conversation for those who have a problem that it, it went on. He, he did that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Bob Iger didn't sneak into his yeah. house and <laughs> yeah, open the safe and steal the Star Wars. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, he, another difference that I think is interesting is he consistently, for how successful Star Wars is, still went out on extremely risky thin financial limbs like clone wars was a big, big one. risk that he was funneling money into right big one big one that they, they remember it wasn't initially well received i'm not even talking about the movie mm-hmm. but the show itself how it looked what's this, this all about it wasn't a, that wasn't an immediate victory yeah yeah so who knows what kind of uh financial limbs he would have <laughs> gone mm-hmm. out on and I, and i do think since Disney, uh, you know, is a is a corporation that there is maybe uh, some just bonkers risks, almost not not even from storytelling, but from a financial perspective that yeah. they might not take that that Lucas might. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. So th- for me, there's some differences. Um, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I, I think uh, one of the, what I was starting to say there with like the George thing um, in terms of the differences. Um I, I 
I understand it is easy to look at a company like Disney that comes in and bought a, a lot and it, it does have a sheen on it. Uh, I even think like Force Awakens looks too clean in a way, right? And, and almost a mm-hmm. literal sheen on it. Uh, I just think what we do here, when we dig in, and, and, and I think my constant ongoing battle is that um, it wasn't just looking at what came before and tossing the same elements in and, and going, look, we have we have movie. I, I really don't believe that. I, I do think there's some things that we're familiar. I think there's some business to the soft reboot around Force Awakens. I think there's some things you want to do. But I, I, I think I, I always want to give the, the creators in this new era – and those, the powers that be, if that's Uncle Bob, even with his mistakes every once in a while, uh, Kathleen Kennedy, the top of, of, I really think they go back to the the core of what Lucas did and that spirit, the rebel and final you're talking about, but all the personal stuff. How many times have we heard Kathleen Kennedy say that? How many times have you heard the creators say that? Like, oh, I was given a lot of leeway to, to not just do what I want in terms of plot, but, but tell the story I want to tell that's personal. That's really, uh, that's a, it's, I'm obviously not talking about a difference. I'm talking about a connective thread between the two sides. And I just, I, but I get from a distance, if you're going to cross your arms and go a big corporation bought it and, and churn stuff out, sometimes not perfectly. I, 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 it's, it's not unfair. I just think that's not the whole story. Yeah. That's not the whole story. And, 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 it's, it's hard when I talk about differences, like I, I, I struggle sometimes. I have this conversation at parties I don't think it's that different. <laughs> That's the problem. It's the George's Georgeness is gone. It shows up in different ways. It's self-referential at times. Again, I think that's even used and said incorrectly. Um, mm-hmm. Friends that said that at parties too. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't want to sound like a, I don't know. I, I don't want to sound like I sound. I, I just, I, I, I watch them and they flow so nicely. Uh, I, I watch Obi-Wan Kenobi and it flows nicely from Attack of the Clones into Revenge of the Sith and Revenge of the Sith and the New Hope. Like it, it, it just all kind of, the sp- it's because they've, they've nailed the spirit of it all, even mm. though it's churning out money, <laughs> even though it's this big thing. And we have all these news conversations about it, but that's just the lay of the land. You can't stop any of that. This is why my argument of pop culture is our culture. It's what formed us. And it is the business now. Uh, Marvel, all these franchises, they aren't going away. Uh, I don't want independent film to go away. I don't want independent thinkers like George to go away. I don't want like fresh IPs to never be created again. Absolutely not. But you can't put all this back in the box. So stop just looking at it as uh, the big corporate box, of which it is, but look at it on an individual art piece basis. That's that's mm. the big thing here. And I, you'll, I think you'll find the differences aren't as, as, as wide. Yeah, no, I I really agree with that. Yeah, yeah. sorry, the stuff you're saying it's great, and and it's definitely you know the the, the Georgeness is missing at times, it, it, or it's a different version of it, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think part of what what I would say isn't maybe present is absolute wild card, and sometimes that's good, and sometimes that's bad. Like, yeah. hey, you know what? For me, uh, I'm a huge fan of the Clone Wars, and I love every episode that. They did. I'm glad that uh, that Lucas wanted to go back to flesh out certain episodes, but the broadcast order of Clone Wars is bonkers confusing. Um, mm. And the show is much stronger if you if you watch it in the chronological order. And that that's just <laughs> mm. that's George Lucas wild card, right? Like I decided I don't care, right? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm glad that Rebels is in the correct chronological order <laughs> you yeah. know yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. so sometimes you get that kind of wild card like lucas george lucas is going to do what george lucas wants yeah. to do right and then sometimes it's a beautiful thing of like you know maul is an interesting character he would fit in this time i got you, you figured out dave somehow maul returned like you, you get a, a gift yeah. from from lucas the wild card right um and part of it is like, i can't predict i can't predict mm-hmm. you know what what you know wild wild thing you would have added but i think this is for me where some of the conversation maybe gets a little wonky is is i do appreciate that lucas would have some wild card ideas but the criticism that modern uh disney lucasfilm star wars is is too much the same and too referential and too repetitive i only agree with that in very small ways i think if lucas made the force awakens a lot of those same new ideas would be there and they wouldn't be flying X-Wings and TIE Fighters. He'd want a new ship. Right, right. That, right. But, that, but ultimately, that's a little bit of storytelling there, but mostly surface level. The idea that Lucas himself does, didn't get attached to parts of Star Wars and didn't reference Star Wars, that was one of the 
litany of complaints from people our age about the prequels of mm-hmm. why oh why why does that character have to repeat that line you know mm. yeah uh, that from the original trilogy when the clone wars started why does every episode have to have i've got a bad feeling about this oh what a shock phantom menace is basically you know a new hope except for this character is that character and it ends with the skywalker blowing up a, a, a big bad mm-hmm. space thing it's the same um those conversations were around back then and there's parts mm-hmm. of star wars where lucas is like i gotta be inventive i gotta be new and other parts are like i already decided i like that it's not changing it's never changing <laughs> mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. he, he was the same in that way so um ultimately uh, i really agree with you about the spirit I, I, m- it's fun to think about is a, a fun what if thought experiment but on in the big picture the guardrails of what star wars is ultimately about are so in sync you know Mm -hmm. it's about hope versus fear it's about our choices defining our destiny it is uh about young people having to make their first steps in the world it is about older people making missteps and having to deal with that It, it is about this tension between uh the fun pulpy adventure thrill in the in the deep mythic morality the the Mm -hmm. idea that it's fun to watch star wars it's fun to watch laser swords and weird awesome bounty hunters but the message is always stand up and fight when you need to but do everything you can to avoid the fight first you know yeah connection understanding pacifism everyone matters the central core ideas that that lucas baked into star wars mm-hmm. are so deeply respected in this era and, and that's what makes it feel like it is still the same to me in in its deepest core mm. yeah because and i think it even pushes at times that we're seeing that more and more bad batch season two how many times have you and i discussed some of the moments that it's just overtly political not in terms of who you're out there voting for in the world but just like the, the politics of, of, of humanity, right? And and, and yeah. how we discuss these things and how we work this out. Like it's in your face. And or of course it's it's easy to grasp because it, it basically every episode's going, hey, we're we're doing this. Um it's not as, as easy to see in the other stuff. But I but I think I, I really do think Bad Batch season two is 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 on the same level of, uh, in terms of that. I think that would have been something you would have absolutely seen more of like you said earlier. Um yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I just, I'm thinking there's. Uh, I got. I was at a party recently, and you know, it's like, oh, don't you just think it's all all the new movies are just Star Wars parts put in a blender? And I, I reject that with all my heart. <laughs> I don't know mm-hmm. how to say that nicely, but in, like you said, in small doses, totally get it, totally get it. I just, I never think it's fair. I just don't think it's a complete thought to say that's all it is. Yeah, I just think I think if people watch the films and feel that way, they have every right to their opinion. But in my opinion, I think the things that make it feel like it is a, a rehash or just Lucas Star Wars in a blender, those things are on the surface, right? Um, oh, it's another coming of age story. It is uh, the the Emperor returns. Uh, they they blew up another Star Killer base, uh, which is basically a Death Star. Like, okay, great, I get it, but. Uh, everything that is motivating that is new ideas, different ideas, or, or wrestling with the fact that, hey, the, these challenges that you face, this essential battle of what the light side and the dark side really, really means uh, is, is eternal. It's, it's always going to happen, and, you, and you're not gonna, you can't run away from it. You, the next generation has to deal with it, has to be prepared for it. What is the responsibility of the previous generation to guide them? Uh, these are both... Uh, ancient ideas, ancient mm-hmm. in the real world, ancient to Star Wars, uh, but combined with a lot of new. And that's, mm-hmm. to me, that's the heart of Star Wars. And I think that's it's part of where the, some of the tension comes from, um, yeah. but also part of what makes it feel the same to me is, is Lucas. I think, mm-hmm. I think Star Wars has always been a, a balance of the new and old. The original trilogy in particular is, is ancient stories and archetypes wrapped up in this shockingly fresh and fun package of uh, mm-hmm. the visuals, the technology, uh, the actors who performed them, uh, the the design elements. It felt both shockingly new and deeply ancient. And I think we're still going in that direction mm-hmm. that there's a lot of old in Star Wars. There always will be. Uh, mm-hmm. But 
what is new? And I think right now what's new is frankly, um, diversity, m more representation, literally on screen, uh, more people getting to see themselves in star Wars. I think the diversity of, of voices, um, just we've got this whole section of star Wars now that's got this very specific tone because it comes from Favreau and, and Filoni, but a lot of Favreau being like, I really like this approach. I really like this style. Doesn't work for everybody. And it's aggressively, similarly, that style, mm -hmm. that flavor, that's new. Uh, hopefully, mm -hmm. the Acolyte is going to bring another new flavor. The High Republic books are bringing another new flavor. The fact that there are, that the sandbox is open and lots of people are playing, that's the new. Because they're all bringing their perspective. They're bringing their favorite parts of Star Wars. And they're creating different flavors while still remaining attached to the core ideas. Yeah. Those guide rails like we talked about before mm -hmm. work for a reason. Yeah, and one of my final, my final thoughts on it is I hear a lot, a lot too, of this um, Disney is too precious with their Star Wars. I, I don't even fully understand it. I, I need to ask, I need to rebut those questions a little bit more when I get them in real life. Of, of Does that mean the fact they had an Obi-Wan series and that it wasn't some new Jedi is that they're too precious, they want to go to characters we're familiar with? Because once we get there, the characters are go through a lot of things that make me seem it's not precious, right? Boba Fett does not remain the faceless, cold-blooded bounty hunter killer. He, he's a different version of Obi-Wan Kenobi goes through some things and interacts with Leia. All those kind of details. Um, that is, again, that's one of the things I just don't think is fully thought out and fair when I hear it. But I want to ask yeah. about it because I don't fully understand what people mean by it. Yeah, and, and to me, I think that is some of the tension of the, the new and the old. Obi-Wan Kenobi is one of the oldest characters, but he went through some new things you know it was new to canon that he didn't know darth vader uh, anakin was alive it's new that he had interactions with leia the character of reva is is fresh and new the idea of inquisitors was not around in the 1970s you know yeah. um there's there's a lot of new within the old and i think part of it is you talk to some people who are like obi-wan kenobi just represents old it's just obi-wan kenobi and he's just fighting darth vader again and, and there's no new and then you talk to other people of like uh, Obi-Wan is sacred. He never met Leia. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is uh, not to be. And that's part of like everybody, is, again, has a right to their opinion. But I think that's a part of the tension that a lot of legacy things are going to have. But Star Wars in particular, because the, the the battle between the new and the old exists in Star Wars on multiple levels. And I think it's telling that some of the loudest criticisms of new stuff is either that it's too old or too new. To me, that says that it is it's it's stretching and pushing and pulling in in both directions in a way that I think Star Wars should. Yeah, yeah. My final final thing is I do I sometimes stay up late at night, eyes open in bed, going, "Well, we didn't have the big three on screen together, right?" I, I understand that one. I bet George would have done that, but I bet Han Solo would have been a half android, <laughs> and <laughs> Chewbacca would have had pants on or something. Like George would have done something a little different. Right. Time to shake it up. Yeah. Chewie yeah. has just 5'11 <laughs> Levi's denim. <laughs> Finally, Chewie gets his leader hosen. Yeah. <laughs> Time to switch it up. Uh, you know what? You know what? Another thing is the same that people got frustrated with Lucas and they get frustrated now. It's like every once in a while, something's just bonkers silly, you know? And oh, yeah. uh, Lucas was committed to that and, and that commitment continues. You know, my, my final thought, I'll say Andor. I think Andor is a, is a great example where the the balance of the new and old worked really well mm -hmm. um, for people. I, I do want to acknowledge, I think there's a hunger in audiences for really new, right? You, you can't, can't ignore it new. And I think Andor's tone uh, of the way the, the show was written, acted, filmed, um, going so into the sort of the, the grounded in the realism and the blatantly political, it was impossible to ignore what is new about it, but as you and I have been very passionate about in our Andrew discussion, almost every beat of politics of philosophy, you can point to a moment of, but there is that in Clone Wars. <laughs> That's kind of a reference to what's happening in the sequel trilogy. Here's the, like, the, so Andor to me is this perfect package where if you really want to dive deep and analyze Star Wars, it is building on what has come before. But on the surface, it feels like a breath of fresh air to a lot of people. And, and I, I hope for that for Star Wars, that, that it is built on the the wonderful soul that Lucas created, but the surface is just like 
you know, when he made the original trilogy, there's something about the surface that's so shockingly new to people, it reintroduces them to the world. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And I uh, love Andor. Love it all. Uh, I think the spirit lives on. I just would love to go back to 77 in the theater and have someone just walk out and go, ah, he just did Flash Gordon. <laughs> and I'm sure people did, right? It's like, yeah. what are they losing their minds over? It's just like, you used to be able to just pick up these silly adventures like when you're waiting for a Greyhound bus for a dime. And now everybody's losing their mind over it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, great question. Thank you uh, for letting us dive deep, Victor, into our feelings about Star Wars and George Lucas and me to half remember various George Lucas interviews. Uh, anyway, I remember the details I'm talking about, but not where they come yeah. from. Yeah. We're going to uh, go on to our next question, which comes to us from Lanky S. Daw on Twitter. Lanky says, hi, Ken and Joseph. Imagine you get to have a tombstone, uh, not the pizza, <laughs> an actual tombstone. Imagine you get to have a tombstone and you get to decide what will be written on it. The only thing is that it has to be a sentence from Star Wars opening crawls. What would it be? <laughs> Yeah, this is great. There, you know, it's fine. You and I, are, the, the risk of stepping on each other is high in this one because there's a, it seems like a lot of possibilities, but really maybe not. There's a lot of sentences that directly reference characters and events that would be a, a little bit odd to have on one's tombstone. I think there's every possibility we have the exact same answers. So I, I'm I'm going to uh, jump on the, uh, the yeah. uh, laser sword and say, you please go first. Okay, okay. I have uh, I have three options. All right, um, and yeah, uh, they almost make me sound like I think too highly of myself. I want to be clear about that. That's not the example. I'm just trying to find something that work. And if someone's passing by in a in a, in a graveyard, just looking at names on tombstones, like uh, like some people do uh, as a hobby or something, you know, um, which I've done too. There, not no shade. Um, this is what it would look like. All right. So the first one is. Luke Skywalker has returned to his home planet in Tatooine in an attempt to rescue his friend Han Solo from the clutches of, of the vile gangster Jabba the Hutt. That does make it seem like I'm Luke Skywalker. But that's, <laughs> um, so because of the same vibe there, my other choice would be Luke Skywalker has vanished. It's there. And then the final one, it's a dark time for the rebellion because I want some people to be sad that I'm not there. <laughs> uh, these are great and different than what I expected. Oh, beautiful, uh, beautiful. Luke Skywalker has vanished is great because it does sound like you are Luke Skywalker. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't want to say I am not. Yeah, but... Uh, uh, yeah. In the sentence, uh, the, the first paragraph sentence of the return of the Jedi crawl is uh, one of my favorites. Um, mm -hmm. But there is something kind of beautiful of like Luke Skywalker has returned to his home planet. <laughs> it's like, oh, if you're looking at Ken's tombstones, like, and in a way, Ken has returned yeah. to his home. What What is death if not returning to one's home planet? It sounds uh, yeah. uh, kind of deep. Yeah, yeah, it's a little poochy as 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 return to some planet, but I, I'll work with it. I'll work with it. But yeah, <laughs> uh, our only overlap is your your final one uh, that mm -hmm. I am tempted by. It is a dark time for the rebellion because, like, mm -hmm. yep, um, maybe that is pumping myself up. I'm like, well, now that Scrimshaw's passed, uh, the rebellion <laughs> suffering is uh, maybe a little <laughs> egotistical, but uh. I do love that line. You and I have talked about. I think other fans are like this of. That one lodged in, in my soul, and and I, mm. man, my uh, one of my comedy friends and I would a, would exchange that with heavy sighs when thing wasn't going well, when we you know didn't uh, get cast an audition or uh, somebody that we were interested in. We were like, hey, would you like to go out on? No, okay, that, you're right, that's fine, and then catch up with one another. How's it going? <laughs> it is a dark time for the rebellion. I'm like, oh, it didn't work out with so and so. No, not at all, not at all. Look. Uh, yeah. that's close to my heart from from using it that way. Yeah, I love that. That's great. Yeah, I decided uh, to go a little bit outside of the field as well with a with a yeah. second option because uh, the Lanky did not uh, specify the saga opening crawls. Mm -hmm. Not technically a crawl yet, but I, I, mm -hmm. I did go to Solo. Okay. And yeah. I thought this would be a fun one. If somebody was just wandering through a, a graveyard and they saw, oh, interesting inscription. I wonder what this means. And it said, on these mean streets... A young man fights for survival, but yearns to fly among the stars. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's that's uh, that's uh, that that's actually perfection. <laughs> that's actually perfection. But people would be like, "Oh, I, you know, hey, he mm -hmm. he, he had a good life, and and now he's among the stars." <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's among the stars. Yeah, um, yeah. but if this was actually a thing, Ken, and I had mm -hmm. to do it, you had to. Uh, 
I had to. Uh, what I would pick is maybe controversial. I don't know. But I would go to the Rise of Skywalker. Okay. And I would have my tombstone say, the dead speak <laughs> with an exclamation point and everything. I mean, that's the answer. That's really the answer. <laughs> and you look around to see if there's a microphone or a camera. Someone's recording you. Yeah, exactly. I think it would be funny, right? Because it would be mm-hmm. like, that's kind of an over the top thing to put on a tombstone. Uh, mm-hmm. But if I wanted to go deeper with it, uh, I think it's true from a certain point of view, regardless of your beliefs, the people who, who came before, uh, are still with us. They're still affecting us yeah. uh, in lots and lots of different ways. If it is nothing but uh, the memories of them and the impact they had. And hey, if I had a tombstone that said the dead speak and people who didn't know me came by and saw the dead speak and wondered what that is, in a way, it would be me continuing <laughs> to mm-hmm. impact the world. Exactly. Love it. Love it. <laughs> ah, that was a ton of fun, Lanky. Good stuff, Lanky. Yeah. Any final thoughts on that one? I'm, I'm not going to be around to see it. So um, you, go, you all tell me later on what gets on there. <laughs> Sounds good. We are going to take a quick break and we'll be back with more uplifting questions. Back. And we are back with more cues of the force. We go now to our patrons on Patreon. This one comes to us from Bryce. Bryce says, greetings, Force Center. I continue to find myself deeply affected by, well, spoiler for Bad Batch Season 2. Uh, tap out mm-hmm. if you if you don't want to be spoiled, uh, <laughs> listeners. Sorry, let me start again. Bryce says, Greetings, Force Center. I continue to find myself deeply affected by Tech's death in the Season 2 finale of The Bad Batch. I can't think of any Star Wars moment that has hit me this hard, and this is the only time a character death in the franchise has led me to shed actual tears. The reason, perhaps, is because Tech was clearly written to be a neurodivergent character and neurodivergent representation in Star Wars, and all media, for that matter, is far too slim. Part of me believes it is unfair that Tech was taken away from the fans who might have identified with him, especially since he was so well fleshed out this season. The other part of me is grateful that a neurodivergent character like Tech was written so well that we all fell in love with him. The only other on-screen neurodivergent character I can think of off the top of my head might be Niku from Resistance, although there may be more, which leads me to my questions. According to you, what is the importance of having neurodivergent characters in Star Wars storytelling? And how do you expect neurodivergent storytelling to continue moving forward? Thank you for pondering my questions, and let's pour one out for tech. Mm-hmm. Indeed, let's pour one out for tech. In general, you know, try to take the, um, the questions uh, as, they, as they come in on our uh, Patreon. Mm-hmm. Uh, but every once in a while, something is a little time sensitive. So we, we jump it up in, in this one. I feel like a lot of people are still wrestling with tech's passing. So wanted to uh, be able to wrestle with it a little bit. And from this perspective, Ken, what are your uh, initial thoughts? Initial thoughts, uh, this is a, a, a wonderful, if not a little sad and tragic sentiment from Bryce here. Uh, the, the death of tech is, is affecting a lot of fans. Actually, this morning I got a, te- a text from a, another friend who just watched it this weekend and was like, can't, I can't believe it. And, and, and it got me. So I, I think um, I think there's a lot in, in several different directions. And I want to be clear as, as someone who's had, um, you know, the... the to be for just be fortunate enough to see myself on screen a lot in Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Uh, I understand that that's not a, a shared perspective and experience from a lot of folks. And, and Bryce, what Bryce is saying, is tremendously valuable uh, to me as a reminder uh, of why this matters and why when you hear a hashtag or see a hashtag, a representation matters. It's real and it's real for someone. It might not be real for you in that moment. You might roll your eyes. You might make an angry YouTube video, but. That is your experience, and it matters for those that uh, that need it. And and Star Wars has gotten better; it continues to get better. Um, if we're always wanting to to make steps forward in our own lives and in our Star Wars. So I think this was a giant step forward. All that to say, I, I I don't want this to sound like any consolation, Bryce. I don't, or to anyone listening, the loss of uh, of tech shows that a character like this can matter in so many different ways, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and that's the ultimate goal is to be on a, a more of a level playing field to where, you know, characters, uh, a character like Tech has um, has the privilege to affect all of us in this way. And this is a this is a historic moment. You know, again, by the way, no matter what happens with Tech going forward, we keep talking about that because, you know, he can show up and he can be this, he can be that. But this moment is so powerful and it's Tech's moment, who he is and who he was. Um, 
mattered and affected us all. And that's pretty giant. That's pretty big. He wasn't just in the, uh, he wasn't wallpaper. He wasn't in the background. He didn't just come and go for an episode. Um, he was the center of it. He was the core and, and, and showed his value and, and, and affected all of us. And there's so many people connected to this character for so many different reasons. Uh, I think there's something to celebrate there. doesn't mean it's, doesn't mean that you don't deserve a hug, Bryce. <laughs> doesn't mean you don't deserve that. Doesn't mean that you, if you want him to stay alive or come back a hundred percent alive, uh, that that's not the wrong. Uh, that's not a wrong answer. That's that's the right answer for you. But you know what I mean. Like I don't ever, but I don't want it to ever be sound like I'm patting someone on the back and going, "They're there, they're there." Um, tech mattered in a way um, that a lot of other Star Wars characters haven't even mattered, and that's and that's a pretty pretty big thing for me to start. Yeah, no, I, very well said. Um, I, I think that uh, I want to start with just empathizing. I, it's, it's a busy, stressful week this last week. Lots of great stuff. Lots of lots of life stuff. I'm so very lucky to be going to to London for Star Wars Celebration. But when you're working on <laughs> something where you kind of have to pause your life for 10 days, it really forces you to look at all of what is in your life and what isn't and what you hope to happen when you get back and it was already a little bit of an intense week for me and, and text passing mm. really affected me. And, mm. um, one of the ways it affected me is my wife hasn't watched bad batch yet. There's just too much to watch. And season two is so good. And I've been telling her like, this has got to be a priority. When we get back mm. from, uh, from celebration, I want to, I want to sit down and watch this. You're going to love this, particularly the second season. And I don't want to spoil her. And, and there's a possibility that, that she'll even make it through, celebration without being spoiled I, I asked her like hey well, what do you remember if i've told you about bad batch she said my wife said the only thing i remember is i know there's one who's really your favorite <laughs> <laughs> so what i'm building to is like uh, yeah. I, yeah. I i'm lucky to have you can i'm lucky to have you know uh four center friends on on social media and on our our live q a but i deal with things by talking to my wife mm. And I've got something that, that really affected me and I can't talk to her about it. <laughs> I just want to, I want to tell her like oh, yeah. <laughs> my Star Wars buddy, he yeah. had a rough day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, so that, that's been, yeah. it's really hit me on a deeper level. Um, I think partially because of that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I ordered the action figure of him having no idea. And, and I got him on my desk and I'm happy to have him here. But like, there's also part of me like, I wish I had him out before it was a memorial, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, anyway, uh, wanted to share some of that personal stuff. Uh, so Bryce, you, you know that you are not alone in, in having strong and complicated uh, feelings about it. it. It's extremely well done storytelling, which is what makes it hard. Um, I think it was extremely good representation. A huge part of what was good to me about it was tech wasn't a sidekick, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. Um, He's one of the squad, and it is a very successful to me ensemble show. I think that the entire squad is important. Uh, if anything, I think we've often talked about a lot of us would have loved a little bit more of a spotlight on Echo from mm -hmm. time to time. But Tech really got the spotlight. He got to have fun moments this season. He got to grow. He got to evolve. He was not the, he wasn't a sidekick. He was a fully fleshed out character going on his own journey. And I think that's what makes it uh, uh, harder to say goodbye to him as well. Uh, absolutely does. Absolutely does. Always, always so like it's so painful, right? <laughs> Press talks about, hey, you got a lot of time this year. Oh, that's why. <laughs> and it really, it hurts. Yeah. But, but I think it like you thought of it, it wasn't a, a sidekick's very valuable. And that's part of what maybe I hope the point I'm making of, of uh, you've said it way better than I. And everyone should check out the tech um, uh, tribute video we have on that Joseph uh, wrote, put out there. It, it's who he was. Um, who he was is, is what he was and, 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 and he didn't need to be anything else other than, than him and he found that part of um, himself in the journey right and uh, you said grow and evolve uh, and, and, and into his the best version of himself uh, that led to this painful but important and inspirational moment hopefully hopefully yeah yeah and I think grow and evolve in a way that um, was still celebratory of who he is right yeah. and that there's yeah. nothing wrong with who he is uh, but he also doesn't need to be limited by other people's definition, right? From the outside, everybody's going to tell him he's not a racer, right? Yeah. Um, but he's like, well, I have all these skills and abilities and perspectives that actually 
could make me not just a good racer, but maybe even look at this from a fresh perspective mm -hmm. and be a better racer in this particular instance. So it is about celebrating the absolute core of who you are while also realizing that, that the skills, the, the, the traits, the things that make you what you are do not have to be limiting. In fact, they can be a launch pad yeah. to doing and being other things as well. And I think the deafness with that storytelling is also one of the huge successes of tech. I, I l love his, his line to fee that I keep mentioning of like when her, her telling him how beautiful the lights are and, and wanting him to agree. And he says, that's one way to quantify it because that's mm -hmm. how he approaches life. Yeah. Maybe he can start to slow down from being a soldier, appreciate beauty more, but he also might make a, a beauty scale. He might make up, <laughs> you know, a, a, a measurement on the beauty scale for himself and share with other people that yes, yeah. that was very beautiful. It was, you know, 8.7 uh, <laughs> butte jewels, you know, of, <laughs> of aesthetic glory. And that might be how he expresses himself, you know? Uh, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Aesthetic yeah. glory. Mm. So uh, to get directly to Bryce's questions, um, what is important for you of having neurodivergent characters in Star Wars storytelling? I think it falls under the 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 large umbrella of this representation matter things I was saying early, but I think uh, earlier, but I, I think uh, that term neurodivergent is still relatively new. I think in the pop culture world, when I say pop culture, I just mean online, social media, conversations of the bar, culture again, uh, and 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 it, and it's such a it's not yet fully understood by a lot of folks. I don't know, even know if I could say I fully understand it, but I I know that what. Um, that what was in, in many ways considered, you know, neuro, neurodivergent people were punchlines and sketches and jokes mm -hmm. and, and their their identities and, and who they were were really tossed aside, along with other many other um, groups. This is why that that representation thing matters. And as someone who just, you know, I didn't have to deal with it growing up, right? I didn't have to mm -hmm. face it and see it or care. I, I saw myself and that was it. And, and it's and it's it's so easy to overlook that. Um, so it just matters, and and, and it matters. Um, as, as we all, uh, a, char a character like Tech could help us all understand this, uh, what who, what a neurodivergent person is or what m there's many in that category, right? It, it, someone like me can understand it in, in a way that I couldn't before because of Star Wars. And it, I always say that seems silly to say, but it really isn't because that's the power of Star Wars. That's why we discuss it at this level. That's why mm -hmm. we discuss Star Wars as art. Um, that matters. Uh, and, and you can get, sometimes it's easier to get concepts when you see it on space screen, on space war screen shows. Yeah. You, you just go, Oh, okay. And I think there could be led, could lead to, to more understanding of, 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 uh, all kinds of people, of course, but what yeah. tech brings that. Yeah. No, I, uh, again, extremely well said. I, I think, um, it, it is important, uh, for all of us, to be seen on screen that we all deserve to be seen and in seen authentically and fully realized. And to me, that is um, the importance of having all kinds of characters, but specifically in, in this context, neuro neurodivergent characters. Um, I always want to be sure we take a question like this, that we are w wanting to hear from people with a lived experience, right? Uh, because yeah. a neurodivergent person is, is the best person to say what it means to them to, to be neurodivergent. Um, for me, uh, tech, part of the reason that I liked him is I saw myself in him as well. Um, mm -hmm. In that video about tech, it, it, uh, I have a part of myself that really loves making lists. Ken can attribute. I send him, I, I try to mm -hmm. <laughs> control reality with <laughs> Microsoft Word documents. Uh, <laughs> My friend Hal Loveland used to tease me about it because we're doing a show together. And he's like, how many pages is a Microsoft Word document where you're going to try to make everything work flowing <laughs> with the show? How many how many pages this month? And I'd be like, it's, it's crept up a page. I'm sorry. Um, I had to accept that, you know, I would send people long emails uh, about shows and, they're, mm -hmm. and overwhelm them. Um, because maybe sometimes somebody's just being a guest, but like, I want everybody to have all the information. And I want it to be listed and organized. And and I had to realize like, oh man, some people just that there, there's a tension because I'm communicating this differently. I feel this differently. Mm. And I think what I loved about seeing tech was you saw the absolute reward 
of his skills. You saw how his skills could be stretched in different ways. You saw how vital and awesome he was, right? Mm -hmm. But then you just saw the, the, the truth of what happens when, when people are coming from different perspectives and different experiences. There's, there's a tension sometimes that needs to be worked through. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so beautiful about uh, the crossing in the episode with Omega, where Omega and Tech are feeling the same thing, but they express them differently. Mm. And and it needs communication. So to me, the importance of of seeing everybody on screen, seeing different people and seeing a part of yourself is to have a have a kind, good faith reckoning with the reward and the beauty of being yourself in the honesty that sometimes, you know, you, you have to leave room for other people's perspectives and you have to work harder to communicate, you know, like mm. um, there's some, there's some times where like, I, I can tell the person needs communication this way. Mm. I can tell that me coming at them in a clipped tech voice <laughs> mm, mm, mm. with a list of what must be done now is going to turn them to slime. Mm. <laughs> and it's what I want to do to feel comfortable. Yeah. But it's going to come across in a way, and I'm not saying this is who tech is or this is who neurodivergent people are. I'm speaking 100% for myself, yeah, yeah, for what I see of myself in tech. Um, and I have to go like, what? Uh, there are these parts of myself that I can't let go of because they're who I am. Uh, but then how do I how do I have that great conversation that Tech and Omega had where they can get on the same page and be okay with? Uh, yeah. we're feeling the same thing. We want the same thing. We're on the same team, but we express it differently. And how can we get on the same page about that? Yeah. No, no, that's well said. And, and it's very much your experience, but I, I got to imagine some folks are pulling it out of, out of tech as well. And I, and, and that's the great thing about tech too, is I, I think the, the connections went to many wonderful different kind of folks, right? I think he was yeah. such a wonderful character for that. Um, side note, jokey note, if, if you took tech and Han Solo and put them on a mission together, that's the energy you have, how we run for <laughs> um, I just go, I don't know how we're going to get out of this one. And you go, I have some thoughts on it. <laughs> and yep. then we, we come together and have for now going on nine seasons. It's amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. And sometimes on the, on the actual, not the character tech, but the tech side of things you take care of things and you'll send me a list of, I think we need this cord and this camera. And I'm like, is it going to, is the thing going to be on? Is there be a green light? Great. I'll talk. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's yeah. good value. We got just tremendous value. And, 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 and you said it so well, I'm almost just remixing of um, tech is, is never the butt of the joke. Mm -mm. There's humor around him. There's humor around who he is, but it's, it's dealt with in such a wonderful way that would not, and I'm not saying for Star Wars, but just would not have been dealt with the same way 5, 10, 15, definitely 20 years ago. No, he would have been the butt of the joke. And 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 I feel like the, the jokes in Bad Batch are, you know, it, as long as it is coming from a good natured place that it, it's, a, it's funny that we're different. And especially mm -hmm. if neither side is being said, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. And if everybody's ultimately working together and, and cares about one another, then it's funny that people come at things from from different ways. And as long as it's not cruel, as long as nobody's the victim of the punchline. And yeah. I think that's that elevated tech for me as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, to, to answer Bryce's other question, how do you expect neurodivergent storytelling to continue moving forward? What are your thoughts or hopes there? I, I the only, this is the only one I really have other than just it, it continues. Um, the two examples here are two wonderful examples, uh, Tech and, 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 and Niku. Um, and I don't think you need to be super, super direct at it, but it wouldn't hurt if, if even a, a new character emerges and we're very clear on who, who they are, uh, as, a, as I say, a neurodivergent character, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that I always, that, that term coded is, uh, is a term I get. Uh, there's certain times it's used where I just, a question how it's being used and stuff like that. That's a, maybe an off force center conversation, but these characters are in many ways. So how about one that's just even more than, and, and a text pretty clear, right? Mm -hmm. I, but I don't need it. I don't need a character to say, but you know what I mean? Joseph is just like, this is who they are. There's no room about it. Mm -hmm. And, and there could be great power in that for me. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, yeah, I think that I want to speak very carefully because I think, yeah, there's, there's, uh, we're taking real world things and we're translating them through the space fantasy filter of star Wars. And that should always be done. Um, 
with responsibility, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, uh, there are instances where real world stuff translates very well into space fantasy and other, other times where you maybe got to be, you know, careful that you're not, you know, uh, that creators aren't coding something. So there's elbow room to have, you know, misunderstanding and hurt feelings. Mm -hmm. Um, but to have, you know, real, real clarity, I think helps everybody. Um, yeah. I think for moving forward, I, I would love to have more neurodivergent um, characters, uh, but I think more neurodivergent, you know, creators. And and I don't I don't have a list of you know mm-hmm. who all is is behind the scenes and, and what their true lived experience is. Some of it we know, not all of it we do. So I'm not going to presume. But um, writers, directors, actors, um, people who have lived experience and they want to say, I love the world of Star Wars. Here's how somebody like me would function. If they were an outlaw like Han Solo, here's how somebody would function. Here's from my perspective. What if what if somebody like me was a Jedi? How would that translate? You know, mm-hmm. um, and, and so it's coming from lived experience. I think that's uh, extremely important. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't have a list off the top of my head, but I think there is just in general in publishing across all the books and comics. There's a lot of characters um, with even more diversity than we're seeing on screen. So existing characters coming from publishing to the screen mm-hmm. and being, you know, brought there with, uh, with responsibility <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to yeah. what, what makes them unique and powerful in the publishing side and make sure that that is there on screen. That's another way that I can see the storytelling moving forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, you've done such a great job. Yeah, absolutely. Um, final thought for me is, you know, I also think it has to be done with care. Uh, but I think bringing different perspectives, uh, that that we might have in the real world, if they're individual perspectives or cultural expect- perspectives, uh, bringing them to cultures. I, I would like to see more stories in Star Wars that are about cultures with different experiences and perspectives trying to work together. Mm. Um, it's, it's there in Star Wars. Sometimes it's such a mainstay of Star Trek, and, and you do have to be careful about it so you're not you know leaning into stereotypes of you know this mm-hmm. is the angry people planet <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> and they yeah. yell all the time right but like that's part of what's fascinating about the mandalorians and in the mandalorians and the klingons kind of have this together of like a part of their culture is warfare so mm-hmm. how do they interact with with other other cultures when a portion of their culture says the only way to interact with another culture is to fight you know yeah. those kinds of of larger cultural issues are really interesting. And I'm not saying that I want, like I said, you got to be really careful about it. You don't want it to be some horrible stereotype of this is the planet of the X people. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, But I think that is a way that different perspectives and experiences can be uh, fleshed out in star Wars is taking, Mm -hmm. taking differences and exploring them on a cultural level as well as an individual level. Agreed. No, I like that. Like that a lot. Star Trek. Any final, all. yeah, the Star Trek of it all. Yeah, the the Klingons versus the Mandalorians of it all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Any final thoughts on this one? Oh, great question, Bryce. Uh, this is uh, when I uh, look at going our, our question before. This is not a, a a look at old Star Wars and 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 getting mad or angry or pointing fingers, but where we are now with Star Wars and a lot of storytelling uh, leads to more of these kind of questions, more of these kind of viewers finding themselves. Uh, more of the more of these episodes and moments and characters having a, an impact, and again, everyone felt the tech loss, right? Which is the beauty mm-hmm. of it. But it had even more power for those who saw themselves in it, and that, that's the that's what we want. That's what you want. There's there's no harm in that. This doesn't hurt yourself. Doesn't hurt the franchise to have more and more of this. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And I think my final thought for me is, you know, I, I think as we've talked about a lot on Force Center, other people have as well. Star Wars core philosophy that everyone's matters means, you know, that we need to keep seeing different kinds of people working together, struggling, celebrating, being whole and complete people with, uh, or aliens, uh, with ups and downs that that's such a core part of what Star Wars is. And I think the more we have perspectives, the, the more that, that beautiful idea in Star Wars that everyone matters, the more that, uh, idea becomes a reality. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're going to move on to our final question from Doomslayer420. <laughs> Love it. Uh, no notes. Doomslayer420 says, 
Sorry if you've answered this before, but I would like to ask Joseph, uh, and we'll expand it out to you, Ken, as well. Uh, how different do you think your relationship would be with Star Wars in a different reality where David Lynch accepted the director's chair for Return of the Jedi? And on the flip side, how differently would you feel towards David Lynch as an artist if the rest of his body of work was still the same as our realities? This uh, much more involved question was inspired by Jennifer being asked how her fandom would be affected had Return of the Jedi included Wookiees instead of Ewoks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Doomslayer420. It is a it is a big, wild, what-if question. I remember that uh, the question coming up for, for Jennifer. And it, it is hard to imagine something so fundamental to mm -hmm. Star Wars and to your fandom actually uh, uh, shifting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Ken, I'm, I'm going to bring up a couple things. I, I want to frame them into a, a question for you, but uh, mm -hmm. do you have any initial thoughts? Yes, I do, but go ahead. This is a great question. <laughs> this is a great question. So my quick answer is this. There's a chance I would have been frightened and never watched Star Wars again. <laughs> there's a lot more behind that. So yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, one of my uh, my initial jokey answer is I think I would have heard of David Lynch much earlier um, uh, yeah, uh, because he would have been famous for being uh, fired and or walking off the set of Return of the Jedi. <laughs> I think uh, I, I am absolutely going to embrace Doomslayer's wonderful what if, but it didn't happen for a reason. Um, and it, it, it didn't happen because David Lynch mm -hmm. saw the truth of like, George, you're an auteur as much as I am. You know, I, I like um, mm -hmm. the the idea of what is rotten under uh, the Americana facade. And I aesthetically, I really like uh, curtains and fire. Uh, you <laughs> like weird Wookiee guys and spaceships, uh, but you believe in it just as much. You have a vision just as much as me. Lynch mm -hmm. was complimenting Lucas by saying, yeah, this is... I, Lynch, would never take something as close to my heart as this is to you, George, and ask somebody else to do it. Why don't, why don't you do it? It's it's yours. Um, so I think, uh, mm -hmm. I think you know, especially knowing that Lucas ended up, you know, on set every day <laughs> anyway yeah, yeah. with with, uh, with Marquand, I think even if Lynch had been hired, I don't think either of them, either Lynch would have walked away or Lucas would have let him go. I don't think mm -hmm. it, it would have happened. I agree with that. And one thing I'll say, because you've, um, you know, you, you've highlighted that before. You're such a Lynch fan, you're such a Lucas fan. I think one of the things that, 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 that the, the legend of Lynch almost getting Return of the Jedi or almost doing Return of the Jedi has always been told from the side of, not, and this isn't from Lynch, but like it always had the, the aura of Lynch looking down on it. I, I, that was not that everything you're saying is true. That's not what he was saying. What he was saying yeah. is, I can't do what's, yours <laughs> just like you can't yeah. do with mine you should go do yours there there's that very funny uh clip of of lynch being asked about this story and he tells a very long lynchian story and part of it is about getting a headache and part of it is about uh george lucas driving him way too uncomfortably fast in in lucas's car which is really <laughs> funny there are two versions of that that circulate and one kind of cuts off where where one could imagine that lynch is being a little bit more like he showed me something called the Wookiee, you know, and it, and it's got mm -hmm. a little bit of like the bleep is this guy talking about energy. Right. Uh, there's a longer version of the video that circulates on YouTube as well, where Lynch says explicitly what I said of like, mm -hmm. uh, and he, I'm paraphrasing, but he says something like, uh, we're, we're very much the same. We, we both really like our ideas. The main difference is that, millions of people love what he does yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so lynch even delivered it in a way is to you know mm -hmm. say there, there's no artistic difference the difference is a lot more people <laughs> vibe with lucas yeah yeah um yeah so um i think the other thing about it and, and i tried not to go on a long uh, lynch rabbit hole here ken mm -hmm. um Lynch has this, this by the skin of his teeth breakout midnight movie hit with a racer head. He he spends five years uh, uh, making this hold up, uh, making just exactly what he wants to. He's a student of AFI and AFI lets him use a big chunk of the property and and a, a half forgets that he's even there because he's living there. He's sleeping there. His a parent, his, his father and his brother pull him aside and beg him to stop. Wow. <laughs> He perseveres very much like Lucas 
on A New Hope, putting himself through hell. Eraserhead is a huge, w- weird hit on the midnight movie indie mm-hmm. 70s um, screen. Uh, Mel Brooks hires him to make The Elephant Man off of right. Eraserhead because Mel Brooks wanted somebody with vision. Mel Brooks went to the mat for David Lynch. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, so he makes The Elephant Man um, and it's got touches of what we would we would call Lynchian, um, it, which uh, I'll stop myself from going into. Um, and the and people tried to cut that out and Mel Brooks stopped them and protected it. Mm-hmm. So then Lynch is uh, goes on and and is like, okay, well, I guess I guess I can be a director for hire, like you do. Um, Brooks Eraserhead was his baby. Uh, Elephant Man, he was protected, mm-hmm. and then he went on to make Dune, and it was misery because he did right. not have Final Cut. He did not get to explore the way he wanted to, and ever since then, he's been like, I don't make a movie unless I have Final Cut. Period. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I make what I make. If you give me money, it's for me to do my thing. That mm-hmm. and that's the way it is. Um, so it, it, it's really funny to look back at Return of the Jedi and use clips from Blue Velvet and Wild at Heart and Mulholland Drive and some of the more wilder uh, David Lynch. But but if anybody's ever really interested in going, what might have it looked like? Watch Eraserhead, watch Elephant Man, and then watch Dune. And Dune is maybe what it might have looked like a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. I think in a world where, where Lucas did say, you know what, Lynch, you do you, uh, or something else took Lucas away. So he was, he was forced to be a little bit more hands off like he was with Empire Strikes Back and Kirshner. Right. Um, I think, I think Lynch would have just, um, dug deeper into the themes of Star Wars that are absolutely present in all of Lynch's work, which is, this deep contrast between the dark and the light. But I think what Lynch really cares about is viscerally making people feel it. And a lot of what I think people respond to is Lynchian is, is certain tropes. It is mm-hmm. Americana. It is curtains. It is fire. It is a fascination with electricity and, and flashing lights. But you, if you break down a lot of his work, it's just about these extreme, extreme opposites between what is dark and horrible in us and what is, absolutely kind and beautiful so i just think he would have pushed it real hard i think jabba would have been disgusting i think mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. flies would have been buzzing off of his rotting flesh that was falling off of him i think palpatine would have been even more terrifying you know i think mm-hmm. his teeth would have been falling out with every <laughs> yeah. you know speech yeah. there'd be weird yeah. flashes and, you, and you'd, you'd see images that make you feel the carnal animalistic horridness of palpatine but then on the other side i think you know there might have been weird representations of glowing manifestations of the light side that that Luke saw, right? Mm. Um, the Ewoks probably would have been even even weirder and even more of of the Earth to really emphasize that, you know. So I, I really think that a lot of it on the surface, just reading the description of what happens in the movie, would have been the same, right. but it would have used a different language of film of of deep guttural upsetting sounds and strange symbolic visions to make you feel what is already present in Return of the Jedi. So here's where I get to my question and maybe you already answered. How do you think you, you would have felt or even your parents have felt if it is every single beat the same as Return of the Jedi? Every idea is there. It's just a little bit more visceral and the upsetting parts are real upsetting and the happy parts are real happy. Yeah, I wouldn't. Have, well, mom wouldn't have let me see that then uh, on many reasons, but uh, many reasons. But my, my, my dad would have probably enjoyed it. Uh, absolutely. Dune's a great example. Uh, but there's kids. I haven't seen Dune. I've never seen any mm-hmm. of Dune. Um, so I, I think uh, I, I'm trying to find an example of during that time of a film that, that might have um, worked. I, I, for some reason, like I always, I always make the joke that like Dark Crystal scared the bleep out of me as a kid. Mm. Uh, that because it was it jumped out of the screen for me, and I'm I'm talking about two different Lynch and Dark Crystal or two different two different things. But you know what I mean? Just put, put my headspace mm-hmm. as a kid. I think your pitch is is absolutely spot on. Uh, the story is so clear, and and um, it 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 uh, it absolutely could have worked in that regard. But um, I think yeah, it just I would have been 
would have been freaked out. I would have been freaked out. And that's not because I've grown to appreciate our elections and artists way more than, than I ever would have thought growing up. I just didn't engage with mm-hmm. the stuff. I don't know why. It might've been because I wasn't allowed to see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's that. There's that. Uh, it has a strong, strong sense of sexuality. So the, the mm-hmm. Han and Leia's moments might have been more intense. Or, yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying it yeah. would have been, you know, uh, anything beyond PG, but it still yeah, yeah. might've been, you know, a little bit more, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. intense um yeah i think for me as a kid to 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 get back to um get back to doomslayer's question I, I i i think uh even if it had come out like dune it would have been a little compromised lynch is is all over yeah. dune but it's 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 you know it's got a weird tone and and star wars hit this great line of being the the summer blockbuster and i would say job is scary the emperor is terrifying uh the rancor is terrifying but it stays on this 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 line that it feels safe a safe level of scary to explore right Mm -hmm. and and the characters do win and there's a happy dance and it and it is happy and there is a little bit of bittersweet with luke and all that but but it's it, it is ultimately very very digestible for a wide audience and i think it it would have struggled <laughs> yeah. at, at the box office. I think I, I think it would have weirded me out a little bit as a kid. Um, and I think I would have later come to appreciate Return of the yeah. Jedi even more. Um, I love Return of the Jedi. I think a few scenes would benefit from, from pushing a bit deeper, a little bit more visceral mm-hmm. in the, in the performance, in the cinematography. I think, I think there's some moments where it, it could have been. Yeah dig just a little bit deeper uh we as fans have lived with it forever and we feel that that depth but i think it could have been a just there's those moments in empire strikes back where it's just a lingering camera on somebody the pain in a character's eyes right and yeah. and and re, for me return of jedi does have some of those moments some moments i'd be like i love this moment i know what's going on but i wish i would i wish we just dug our fingernails in just a little deeper mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, Jedi would have been um, a lot of conversation you have around Jedi by uh, the more film elite types uh, would have the conversation would be different. You know, it, 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 I think it could have been held up as, as it, it, like Empire a little bit, maybe not as uh, you know the, the pretty package that Empire was really at the end of the day. But you know what I mean? Like it would have would have been years from now. Be like, well, you know, the actual the good one is Return of the Jedi. You mean the weird one? No, no, it's the best. Like, that would have been <laughs> yeah. I don't think it would have gone well at the box office, but I think um, hey, a lot of Lynch's films uh, that some were received well at the time and, and some were attacked. Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me was uh, attacked and, and, and in a very Star Wars way because everybody had certain expectations of Lynch or of Twin Peaks and he made his thing. Uh, yeah. Just like George Lucas, he painted his house white. <laughs> that's, the way, that's the color he wanted, and now it has been re reexamined. So I think you know who knows what what would have happened to Star Wars, um, but I, I think it would have struggled at the time and then be revered later. Is actually this is a fascinating exploration. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Doom Slayer, for for that uh, fun and interesting question. Uh, do my best to widen it out and make it not mm-hmm. just uh, Joseph goes on about David Lynch Center. At the end of the day, find yourself that longer version of the Lynch story because it's hilarious and it's a tribute to it. both of them. And yeah. Lynch was dead right. This was Lucas's vision. He is an auteur, George Lucas, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. He is an auteur who makes incredibly expensive indie movies back in the day. Yeah. And uh, I think it was right that he stayed so closely attached to making the, the, the film Return of the Jedi what he wanted it to be. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm going to go seek out that interview. I've never really seen it. But again, because of the distance, it just has that like, um, you know, hoity-toity artist t- talks down on, on pop filmmaker. And that's not fair to either of them. I don't think that's accurate. So I think it's great to no. check that out. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for the questions. We're going to move on to our Power of the Light Side segment. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is something we offer to patrons. If they want to share a thing about Star Wars that has brought them joy or insight, uh, they can put it on the submissions. If you're a patron and you're looking for this, go to our posts page, scroll down a little bit, and there's a picture of Obi-Wan Kenobi smiling at the Skywalker twins and let us know your Power of the Light Side submission. This one this week comes to us from Brian Babcock. Here's what Brian has to say. Hello, Force Center friends. 
For my power of the light side, I thought I'd share what a positive influence listening to Force Center has had on me. Uh, as we all know, the world, and in no small part, the internet is often divided by an us versus them mentality, whether it's political views or something as simple as Xbox versus PlayStation or Star Wars versus Star Trek. Despite loathing this way of thinking, I found I would often slide into such debates with people as I didn't uh, really have a way to articulate my real thoughts. If someone said to me, oh, you like PlayStation? Xbox is way better because this and that. My response was often, I don't care, Xbox sucks <laughs> because of this and that or something similar. Also, while getting tired of being bombarded by such toxic talk about Star Wars left and right, I asked my friend if he knew of any Star Wars podcast that didn't spend all their time just crapping on the series. He immediately recommended Force Center, and since that day, you guys have felt like a warm blanket of positivity, and your method of discussing things has helped me articulate my thoughts and feelings to other parts of my life. If someone says, oh, you like PlayStation? Xbox is better because I can now say, hey, if you prefer Xbox, that's great. For me, PlayStation just has the exclusive titles I'm more interested in. If it's Star Trek versus Star Wars, I'll say, hey, Star Trek is awesome. It just never hooked me the way Star Wars has. I found being able to have this outlook in such th simple things in life has allowed me to have that outlook on bigger issues, which has had an overall positive effect on my mental health. So I wanted to thank you, Joseph, Ken, and Jennifer, for all that you do. I also wanted to give a shout out to my buddy, Justin Dam, for recommending Force Center all those years ago. Thanks for reading, and may the Force be with you. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I say uh, thanks to you, Brian, and thanks to you, Justin, <laughs> for yeah. recommending. Uh, Brian, check us out. Brian has been a great listener and supporter. And, uh, and Justin, wow, uh, thank you for the recommendation. Ken's, what are your what are your thoughts on this one? Oh, I love hearing this stuff. I, I really do because this is also uh, Brian and Justin. This is how I've changed, and and it's it's, it's interesting because at times it's a struggle. I, you know, I'm still a comedian. I still go up at clubs around LA, and comedy sometimes you feel as though you have to base it in anger, and that's not exactly true. But that's just especially if you're on clubs, and I don't talk about anger, but just like. You want to be like, let me tell you why Xbox sucks, right? It's just sometimes the lay of the land that I find myself not wanting to engage with anymore and finding a different style. That's come out of how I talk about Star Wars. That's come out how I engage with it and how I look at other worlds. And because and I also keep saying times have changed, right? Um, and all of this matters more, not just pop culture, but how we communicate with each other really does matter. So the example I always give is, is a silly one, but it's, 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 um, well, there's two. I've joked about one on the show before, but it's like, like I love, I love pineapple on pizza. I absolutely love it with all my heart. Other people don't. Grace, in my house, thinks it's disgusting, right? It's like we don't, you know, we don't do it. But it used to be a fun debate, and it used to be kind of fun. But we didn't realize what that really was doing. And I've been, I've had people sincerely pissed off at me because I pint like pineapple on pizza. And if you think that doesn't stick to just pizza. That it doesn't spiral out to how you look at the world and how you communicate with the world, that you're mistaken. And I think that's what's changed about how I approach comedy or how I approach what I do. It's not just simply finding the positive. It is, uh, it, it, it is, it's just looking at things in a different way. I, I joked, I think, on a podcast before, like, I despise in and out hamburgers. Uh, and I, you know, occasionally will say that. And then initially, and I, you, you, you haven't muttered on your breath, well, I like them, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> and, 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 and that that so it's important for me now to go for me i think they're mushy dish rags but for you <laughs> they're why you moved to california like you know what i mean like like and it's just once you once you do your best to remove your own experience and your own egos or at least set it aside not remove it cuz you know again you're not going to you're not going to get me to love in and out hamburgers <laughs> it's not going to change for me but once i'm able to put that aside and see what you enjoy about it Man, just things. I hate to sound like a Coke commercial, like to teach the world to sing here for the seventies, but like it, it really <laughs> does matter. It really does matter. And this for me really did start with Star Wars, even early days of Force Center, where a little bit of me were going puffer pigs are dumb. I don't like the name Captain Phasma, and that was a dead end road. It also, was a dead end road because then it turned out, oh, I kind of I like Captain Phasma, but I've already said it a lot of times <laughs> that I don't like the name. How do I, how do I, you know, so it's just, it's, it's, it's Brian, I feel you. It's not just you who's gone through this. I personally have gone through this change because of Force Center. Yeah, no, I, I, I really, really appreciate Brian's perspective. And it, it's so great to hear. Cause I mean, I, I still get sometimes, you know, 
people ask what I'm doing and, and, you know, I say, I got this going on. I'm trying to do this creatively and four center that Star Wars podcast is, is real solid. And, and sometimes I can see it in people's eyes. <laughs> They're like, Mm-mm. Oh, okay. It's, it's, you're still managing to find something new to say about a lightsaber, huh? Like, um, it's really gratifying to hear Brian talk about this because I think that, uh, what I love about the podcast and our community is, is we do have fun. Just what's our favorite lightsaber fight. <laughs> yeah. I, we, I do have fun just being like, I love, I love Luli Lil Primak because he's an upside down frog guy crooning. Mm-hmm. Great. Uh, there is a lot of just celebration, but also like I, I hope by getting at some of the ideas in Star Wars that we're talking about something uh, that, that Star Wars is, is a door into, into bigger things, you know? Yeah. Into, yeah. into not even bigger things in Star Wars. Cause I think that's, that's why I love it. Star Wars is about big things and, and applying them to mm-hmm. our life um, mm-hmm. is really powerful and important. And I, I agree with you. I think, um, I think that just stating our opinions and fighting for them is, is it can be good, uh, mm-hmm. but also just having to um, be aware that there are opinions and that actually might, to me, it's just far more interesting of like, hey, can can somebody articulate why they mm-hmm. respond to uh, in and out We haven't had the in and out Burger conversation, but if like mm-hmm. if I could like understand like when did you first have it? What are your mm-hmm. other favorite kinds of burgers? Like I'll learn some stuff, right? And I'll learn your perspective, right? Yeah. Um, it maybe part of my enjoying them is like I didn't. It's a it's a style of burger that isn't in the Midwest, you know. Right. right. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's where some of it is coming from. It it's it was it's a special treat. It's one of the things that uh, you know, when I moved here, everybody's like, oh, and now you get to try that. So it makes me feel like hey, this is a part of my process of becoming an Angelino. So like there are all these things attached to it that aren't just taste buds, right? Yeah. That. Yeah if we can just have a conversation, we can get a lot out of it <laughs> totally, uh, and learn a lot. And, and it, it, the, the food thing is such a great example. Cause like, what does it do to your mouth? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that I enjoy feta cheese on mm-hmm. a pepperoni pizza. It's totally fine. that it's not for you, mm-hmm. but the flavor doesn't go to your mouth. <laughs> Why does one of us need to be correct? You know? Yes. Yes. Why does one of us need to be correct is a big thing behind it all. And I think, I think for me that there is us versus them, which limits conversation. But the other thing about it that is really vital to me is, is to go through and identify them like, Hey, uh, uh, your, your favorite Star Wars film, your uh, favorite uh, <laughs> Southern California uh, cheeseburger, like mm-hmm. those are subjective. And then you get into some differences like, Ooh, you know, is I understand we come at this from different reasons and why, but politically we have to decide. We're mm-hmm. going to vote, and that in what we make law is a reflection of who we are. So, like that actually does affect me. You know, yeah. and learning to separate out and try to still have productive conversations and say you can, hey, as long as it's not endangering me, put ice cream on your pizza like a Ninja Turtle. Mm-hmm. I don't care. But then where where those moments were like. I still want to break down the us versus them mentality. I still want to understand where you're coming from. But at the end of the day, this really matters and it affects people in that there's a difference between yeah. what goes on your pizza and what laws we pass sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit, but yeah, but it definitely, I think once you're able to, um, yeah, just stop seeing it all as a, as an ongoing YouTube debate show. Yeah. Um, yeah. To just deescalate and, and try to understand where somebody else is coming from is, is powerful. Yeah. It's why, so I love that, that Clone Wars line, you and I mentioned the live, live show, uh, you know, but from episode three of I'm not here to talk politics. Uh, well, yeah, of course you're not. If you were, you might find that they, it doesn't align with what's in your heart type of mentality. <laughs> you know, yeah. I think that spins out of pineapple pizza sucks. No, it's great. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, in the, I think, um, I think another thing about it for me and, and we can wrap up is, Hey, if we really need, to if we re, if we respect opinions as opinions is utterly subjective i think that will help us um treat facts as facts you know mm-hmm. uh, i i i don't i don't want to be a scold or tell anybody else how to speak in any way and and it, it, it is stronger to just say i like this movie it was good you know and, and I, I know there are people out there who feel like they don't want to be policed in, in tone policed into having to say i feel every time like i get that i I do understand that, mm. but 
uh, in my life experience, I've found people who, 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 who have said like, well, this movie is good. And like, and I'll be like, well, I, I, I liked it. And like, you can't, it's, it's not good. <laughs> yeah. And realize, oh, you, most people don't mean it that way, but you truly believe your opinion is fact, right? Yes. And by uh, celebrating subjective as subjective, pineapple on pizza is subjective, will help us go, hey, um, science has figured this out. <laughs> yeah. And it really makes a difference to all of our lives. And that's a fact, right? Yeah. 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 The, the different rules of law say thir- certain things and they don't. That's a fact, you know? Yeah. And and being able to have respect for both, I think, and the difference between them also is going to help us culturally in the long run. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, re- I really think it matters. I really do. I really do. But I'll tell you what, Joseph, uh, we'll head to in and out We'll have it. We'll, we'll get a couple of burgers. Because I'll tell you one thing I do like, the secret menu. If I just get the grilled cheese... I like it. It's a different experience. So there you go. I'm open to it. I haven't had the grilled cheese, so I'm going to have to try that. And maybe I'll be like, I hate the grilled cheese. It's I awful. It. Welcome to Burger Center. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, once again, thank you, Brian. This is this is a really uh, touching and, and meaningful uh, comment to get. So thank you very much uh, for sharing it. And we look forward to hearing uh, all of your Star Wars opinions, what lands for you, what doesn't, why you love them, uh, why you struggle with them. All that stuff uh, going forward. Thank you so much, Brian. Ken, where can people find us? Hey, you can find us on Twitter at Force Center Pod or on Facebook at Force Center Podcast. Instagram as well. Hive Social if you're over there still. And we have uh, got ourselves our YouTube channel. Subscribe over there if you've been hanging with us during Star Wars Celebration. A lot of stuff emerging from that, of course. So subscribe. Don't want to miss the next live stream. Figure fights. All that stuff is over there. Podcast available on a lot of spots. Just search. You'll find us. But places like Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more. Merch available at tpublic.com slash user slash Force Center. You can support us directly at Patreon dot com slash four cinema you can follow me at catnapsock or go to, go to my website catnapsock.com or check out my youtube channel i've put a lot of new things there kind of revamping some of the stuff over there more shorts segments uh game streams are now on youtube as opposed to twitch so follow me over there joseph where can they find and follow you and your burger tastes <laughs> uh, you can find my new uh burger tiktok videos that i'm gonna be doing and maybe who knows uh on all the social media i'm at joseph scrimshaw on twitter on instagram on mastodon on tiktok and you can check out my youtube channel for some comedy bits some of them where i'm angry and ranty even uh, what a shock uh and uh some of my short films all on youtube just search for joseph scrimshaw uh but for now for myself for ken uh, for the wonder that is tech this has been cues of the force Yeah.